Welcome new subscribers. Thank you subscribers for following, sharing, liking our videos, supporting our channel. I appreciate you. If you're new to our channel, hit that subscribe button right now. My name is Reverend Penelope Stewart. You can follow Chemistry on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Today, I wanted to do a part two of the hidden truth of America to Mary and the matriarch empire and its influence over the world. We're really going to get deep with this right now, you guys. I have did a lot of research. We're going to be going through some of my notes. I want to hear your feedback, your comments, your observation respectfully. You know, uh, the ancestors' my, my, uh, mothers are just showing me so many things on this journey, a lot of imagery, a lot of stuff that I didn't see at first. I'm seeing it now, and I'm also sharing it with you guys, too. So if you are one of those Afrocentrics, uh, you think this is feminism, or you're stuck in that Afro Africa theory, this probably is not going to be the video for you. Because I'm going to have some information here that's going to be challenging you. It's going to challenge what you have been told, what we have been taught. And it's exactly what it's supposed to do. But her story deserves to be told. You know, they don't tell her story. And we've already seen the, you know, patriarchs ain't been on the scene that long. And she has a long history. So find a look, just even a little bit of it, it makes all the difference, man. You know, it's sad. It's real sad how they, they, they have done this. You know, it makes me sad that we, you know, they'll say that she is God. They'll say the black woman is God. But yeah, they, they won't go through all this and, and, and say, hey, here it is right here. You know, and it deserves to be looked at and say, here is your mother right here, humanity. This is where you come from. This is her. You know, and that's basically what I'm saying. This is where, she, where we come from. This is not feminism. This is based in fact. This is based in fact. You know, they don't want to talk about it, but it is what it is. You know, so let me dive in here and just go over some of these notes and talk a little bit about the notes as I go through the video. Now, the first concept of God was a female, and she was the representation of the supreme being. You know, the female has always been a representation of the supreme being. You know, don't get it twisted. It may not look like that now, you know, and you know the saying. Men run the world. Women make it go round. Okay? Without us, it, it wouldn't be people. We populate the planet. All right? Ancient women can be seen as gatherers of grains, seeds, root berries, and plants, which was the first form of organized cultivation as early as 15,000 BC. These women went all over the world showing people how to plant, how to grow food, you know, even sharing uh, some of uh, their grains with other nations. And we're gonna talk about that too, you know. I don't know if it's gonna be in this video, it'll probably be in the next video. In Egypt or Kush, the importance of women was so respected, children took the surname of their mothers. Rituals, symbols, which were ceremoniously consecrated and depicted as proof of the, of the descent from her holy blood. The Egyptian term for throne was also st, st, and may have shared a common etymology with Isis name. Therefore, the Egyptologist suggested she was originally a personification of thrones. You heard that? She was the throne. Believing that the throne was considered the king's mother. See, he got his power from her. He said, no, her. All right? Don't get it twisted. That's what she said. I'm sitting there. Look, I'm the only one with the feathers. I'm the only one with divinity. Hey, I'm giving him something. I'm giving him royalty. I'm giving him power. Look at me. You know, that's what she was saying to me. And thus a goddess, because of its power to make a man into a king. 
Isis was therefore the mythological mother and wife of kings. She was described as the protectress of the entire nation, as the deity that protected Egypt and endorsed its king. She had power over all nations. All, are you hearing it? Now you're hearing it right there. She had power over all nations. And as the provider of rain, she enlivened the natural world. Isis was also known for her magical power. She enabled, it enabled her to revive Osiris and to protect and heal Horus. When Egypt was ruled and settled by Greeks, Isis came to be worshipped. So they didn't come in and worship another god. They came in and they worshipped Isis. She still kept her status. All right, that mean, man. She was worshipped by Greeks and Egyptians, along with the new god Serapis. And see, that's what that that is that that's the catch right there. That Serapis, because see, that's where that Jesus come from. That's what we got when these patriarchs begin to take over. You know, let's not forget about Constantine. That's that's when that merge happened. Okay, she was the Holy Grail. In European myth, I know you've heard that they're looking for the Holy Grail, but the Holy Grail was always her. It was always the ancient divine mother. It was always the black woman. I bet you didn't know that, but you know it now. <laughs> we know it now. She was also depicted as a serpent in the Garden of Eden, giving man fruit from the tree of knowledge so he would know the truth, but he rejected it. Like I said, everything with the patriarchs is totally backwards. They're not connecting with the earth, with nature, the universe. We're in these churches. We're worshiping material things, you know. Not good for the human spirit because the human spirit has to make that connection with the universe. It has to make that connection with Mother Earth. Although Christianity has made the serpent look bad or evil, if one only knew the true meaning of, the, of that verse and its ignorance portraying something holy and sacred as something bad and evil, and it's exactly what they did. There is so much to say about the women's spiritual leadership. In this time of fragmented, toxic culture, we don't even have words adequate to describe the breadth of heritage and the practices of this ancient mother. So much has been lost, so much has been forgotten, so much has been ignored. You know, we don't even scratch the surface just with the little bit we know, we know because the patriarchs came up and burnt up a lot of stuff, plagiarized a lot of stuff, flipped a lot of stuff. You know, the world just been flipped. You know, like I said, we had that gender war, war you know, that was a catastrophe. And then right after that, we had this race war. That was another catastrophe and just left humans in a state of confusion and ignorance. You know, some of us just don't know. We're having to dig through this stuff and find out the truth. But there are a range of names and culturally defined meanings, including shaman, medicine woman, diviner, spirit medium, oracle, sibyl, and wise woman, and many more names. During the ancient era, kings, priests, and priestess of ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Ethiopia were considered gods who claimed of the red bloodline from one or more of the Nagas. Because you're going to see these Nagas everywhere. You're going to see them in ancient Egypt. You're going to see them in Asia. You're going to see them in Indonesia. You're seeing it in the Americas. That's how you, we know that these ancestral mothers were traveling the world. It's not far-fetched that they were able to travel to different continents and share their gifts and start civilizations there. It is not far-fetched. Shiva, Buddha were worshiped as king of serpents in Egypt and they were displayed nursing by Naga in the form of a woman possessing the head of a serpent. There was a matriarch system 4,000 years in Egypt. Mother has known as Puruachit. Pur the Miami goddess deity was venerated in the delta of Lower Egypt, and it was very much later when the very much later. Let me emphasize it. Very much later, when the pharaonic orders and sacred kingships were introduced, and legitimacy came from claiming direct bloodline from the priestess 
Sibyls, the Divine Serpent Mother. Many people are not aware of the serpent being related to the Divine Ancient Mother, yet this depiction was popular in ancient era. The snake is the universal sacred totem, and is the, and specifically the cobra and the python. So we see here the Umfei. I wanted you guys to see the Umfei. This Umfei was located there in Thesi, Thes, Thebes, Egypt. You know, the Umfei is the holy uterus, the first womb that gave life to humans. So before there was a phallic, it was the Umfei, the Umfei. And we see the primordial snake around this Umfei here in the second picture. And then we see in the third picture here, um, we see a matriarch look like she is venerating the cobra here. All right, so and the snake has been in ancient Egypt for a very long time, but you're going to see that as we move on. And if you're interested in looking up the Umfei, you have to look it up as the Umfei stone. Umfei stone, if you're interested in doing some research on the Umfei, the holy cervix, before there was the phallic, there was the Umfei. The serpent is the first totem phallic ancestral deity manifesting as the co-creator in her role as mother of procreation. Because she, she mothered by herself. She didn't need a man to mother. The first mother, ancient mother, didn't need a man to procreate. She was the, she could procreate by herself. All right? She could, one who could, you know, have babies without a man. You heard that in one of my videos. Miami Wata Serpent, which is an ancestral mother, is rumored to have produced an entire race of Scythians. And we see the Scythians right here on the, uh, on the left-hand side. We're going to talk about the Scythians also. So what they're saying here, it was one woman that went over there in that area. And all these people, all the Scythians, belong to this one civil woman, to this one woman. They came from her. All right, that's what they're telling you right there. The serpent, you know, they came from her. All right, and we're gonna talk about the Scythians a little bit later. I hope I get be able to do it in this video. If not, then I'll have to do a part three because we're gonna be covering quite a bit in this video right here. The Celestia Serpent is the first deity that ascended from the divine waters, known as goddess in primordial form. India is given the recognition of the origin of serpent worship, but it originated in the matrineal culture. Serpent worship can easily be traced to the early migration of serpent tribe as they travel from east to various parts of the world. Serpent worship is an ancestral spiritual practice and culturally links to the Indio Negroes and the Afro Dravidians, cultures who traveled from the Fertile Crescent in southern Libya. And so you're seeing this serpent, this celestial serpent around her, all right, the Divine Mother. Don't forget these feathers are all around her too, all right? This represents that, that matrineal culture right there, all right? Take a good look at that. The tradition of Nagas was transported by traveling matrineal tribes known as Taurans or Ophites, meaning serpent worshiping tribes. The Taurans, known as ancient Hebrews, later established a patriarchal, later established as patriarchs, Levites, with male prophets and priests in the Mami Wata Temple. The prophetess and priestess females were Ophites. They were called Pythonists of the Mama Wata Temple because men and women, both men and women, carried the snake, sometimes wrapped around their neck. Wajid was the patron goddess of Upper Egypt and was represented as a cobra with spread hood or a cobra-headed woman. She later became one of the protective emblems on the Pharaoh's crown once Upper and Lower Egypt were united. 
serpents or nagas played a particularly important role in Cambodian mythology as well. A well-known story explains the emergence of Khmer people from the union of an Indian indigenous and indigenous elements, the latter being represented as nagas. So you see these women go everywhere, all over the world, and produce these, uh, these populations, civilization, children, all right, you're seeing that they're telling you that right there. All right, so you see this serpent on the top of this Egyptian priest head, and you see the Nagas here in, I think this is Asia. I think this image is from Asia, maybe Hinduism, you know, but you, you're seeing it. You're seeing the links right here. Many indigenous cultures uphold female spiritual leadership, like the Mapuche of Chile, the Karak and Yurok of California, as well as others in South Africa, Siberia, and Indonesia. While some imperial and feudal societies generally suppress women's open exercise of a religious authority, this suppression caused temple women to gradually disappear from West Asia and patriarchal Rome tried to stamp out women's mysteries with witch hunts. Holy women are more visible historically and more likely to be given honor and power in their own right than most women in patriarchal societies. Their authority tends to transcend divisions of society into religious and political spheres. We can observe this pattern over large ranges of time and place and in very different kinds of societies whether they are early Sumerian priestess or female shamans acting as village of chieftains acting as village chieftains I apologize in 1st BCE the first mention of Sib a Sibyl named Sabbath described as a Babylonian or Hebrew. Pythia is a Sibyl who gained popularity among the Greeks. She served as an oracle at the Temple of Delphi. The name Pythia is de derived from Pythia, remember the Pythoness, which, which was the original name of Delphi. The Sibyl sided with the oppressed people and predicted doom to the wicked rulers when the Roman Empire came to rule over Asia. Oriental subline literature evolved into virulent anti-Roman propaganda. So these, these women, they were prophesying. This is when these prophecies started to come. These prophecies that you see in the Bible, they came from these civils, and this is when they start uttering all these, these dooms and woes and stuff. And they were recorded. They had a book where they record things called the subline literature or the subline oracles. Here they are describing them as Oriental. However, these were Aborigine women that migrated all over the world. The strong note of hope and for final redemption influenced the Jews to adapt their popular pattern, pattern of subline poetry to the needs of their national religious propaganda. The Levitical order was trying to appease to the people the people and mimic the Sibyls. The patriarchs collected the Sibyl, Sibyline oracles and used it to write their Bible and other sacred books. Alright, so that's what happened to the, uh, you know, when they say the black woman is God, you know, they are telling you, right, off the bat was you know was really going on so a lot of her prophecies and stuff were stolen and then they were put it in the Bible and then the patriarchs wrote their stories around these women's store uh, uh, stories and in the Bible you see them marrying these Aborigine dark women in the Bible if you pay attention to that they're marrying these Aborigine dark-skinned women
a male takeover of women rights and mysteries it described in oral histories from Australia, Melanesia, the Amazon, Basin, Tierra del Fuego, Kenya, Sierra Leone, and elsewhere. The Levitical order dominated the serpent practice from Thebes to Heliopolis. Later, the priest of Apollo took control of the oracle shrines of Delphi and Didyma, interpreting the women ecstatic utterances and forbidding women the right to consult Pythias. So they wouldn't even let them have contact with the Divine Mother anymore. They cut them off from their spiritual practice. So you have a lot of these women leaving and going other places too. Uh, and then uh, many of them were being kidnapped as well. You see that in the movie Scorpion uh, uh, King. And you see that kind of too in the movie Suicide when she kidnaps the Enchantress. And the Enchantress looks really, really old. You kind of see a witch hunt thing goes on too with that movie with uh, Vin Diesel in it, uh, The Last Witch Hunter. That's kind of around, that's, those stories are centered around what was going on, uh, the war that was waged against those metaphysical, magical women in that time. Male heferents also gradually consolidated their control of the mysteries of Elysius. Ancient oral history says the Amazon queens founded the great temple of Artemis of Ephesus. Women were later forbidden to enter the Holy of Holies, according to Roman era writer Artemidros. Patriarchal colonizers stigmatized cultures that honor female spiritual leadership, calling them barbaric and inferior. So you see what happened there, you know? And there was nothing wrong with it. There was nothing wrong with the spiritual practice. They, it was just so powerful, they wanted to stamp it out. And that's really what happened there, you know. This is her story. This is the story of your ancestry mother. This is the story of the ancestors. The same dynamic played itself out in the colonization of America. Mesoamerica, there was an evident, evidently there was a shift in the roles of women play in ancient Maya society compared with the previous two centuries. It was during this time that there was a great deal of, of political complexity seen in both, seen in both in Maya household as well as the Mayan era. Warfare was a significant factor in political competition, and marriage was one of the ways that alliances were made between the different people. The royal names of the matrilineal culture could possibly be associated with the name Caraca. Caracas were the heads of clan family units. They served as tax collectors, held religious authority, in that they mediated between the supernatural sphere and the moral realm. They were responsible for making sure the spiritual world blessed the mortal one with prosperity. So it took me a while to find this codex right here uh, because they don't show these codexes that much with the women in there. So I had to really, really dig around and find this codex. And so what you see here is this woman, this woman, like this woman is possibly uh, she's anointing this man or woman, you know, because they look alike, they dress alike. But you for sure know this is a woman in front of him with the feathers sticking out. Again, we have the feathers. And like she's giving him something or blessing him or something during this time. But this, I thought this codex was very interesting. It was very interesting codex, something that I've never seen before. And I, I thought it would, was worth sharing here in this video. So, yeah, look at that. The woman is right there. You don't see that too often. It took me some digging to get this. All right, and that's kind of trippy, too. I see this woman over here holding the head. That's kind of scary there. Like she's holding a head here uh, with these little stars on her dress. But, yeah. Most illustrations and sculptures from the time depicted kings and queens alike in ambiguous ceremonial garments. 
Maya had many warrior queens. Some queens sported symbols of war in their headdress, and others armed themselves with battle shields or waved war banners. So you see, they looked alike. It was very hard to tell the men from the women, you know, because you have her in this battle uh, attire here, or this ceremony, ceremony attire here, and you can't really hardly tell she was a man or a woman. And then you see the image here on the right, you can barely see a uh, tell if this is a woman, a, uh, a female, or male. But I could tell because she has this baby here, and then looking at her hair, and she has a very soft face. So I can tell that this is a woman. All right, so take a close look and see these images are very, they're hard to come by. But they're worth showing you so you can see the links. Khan is another title of an unknown origin for a ruler or military leader. It first appears among the Gok Turks as variants of Khagan, meaning sovereign emperor, and implied a subordinate ruler. Isn't that something? You know, subordinate ruler. Russian linguist Alexander Volvin believes that the term meaning emperor or supreme ruler. See, that's what another another um, historian thought that it meant it was a subordinate ruler. But the Russian linguist Alexander Volvin believes that the term meaning emperor or supreme ruler and was later used in several languages. According to Volvin, the word Quan, uh, Quan or Qua means great or supreme. Hieroglyphic inscriptions offer clues about the role of Mayan queens. During the early part of the 20th century, archaeologists from Carnegie Institution for Science in Washington, D.C. deciphered the dates on a Kalamek. Kulak mode stellar featuring a warrior queen. So they found out that she was a Khan. So you see the Khan over here uh, on the left. Then you see these feathers and you know these feathers. Again, these feathers were very popular in the Americas and so you see these women here look like they're ancient Egyptians. And remember ancient Egypt, Egypt ancient Egypt was called Kemet or it was called to marry, it was associated with ancient America, to marry, or it was called Nubia. And in fact, the whole continent of Africa at one time was known as Ethiopia. So African is not the true name of Africa. That's someone who conquered the country, all right? That, that belongs to a colonizer. That's not the true name. These are not the, usually these names have changed with the colonizers. So it's good to find out what is the, what was the ancient name of that country to really find out where you really at and who you really are as well. So in the third uh, picture here is depicting another woman, a con. You know, she could be a cocoris as well. But you seeing her with these feathers and you see this iguana or alligator again this indicates that she may have been a part of the amazon empire of the matriarch empire all right she may have been a matriarch a queen a con all right This and other similar findings led Reese Taylor to believe that most of the warrior queens in Maya society rose to power after 623. We know this is false. Let me just move on. I digress. During a systemic geopolitical shift in the Mayan world, around this time, northern royal family known as Khan or Snake Dynasty moved into the rainforest of central of the central lowlands in the middle of the Yucatan. All right, so we know that's not true. We've already did it. research on that. What happened was there was a shift from matronial to patronial or from matriarch to patriarch. That was the shift, but they have you thinking that it was patriarchy all along, and then they decided to let the women rule, and that's just not true. I've already shown you the definition of that, 
I've already showed you the proof of that, but you see the manipulation in some of these, you know, some of these historians, the way they want to write things. Archaeologists, they will confirm that it was a matronial culture. In fact, some of them will say it was a matriarch culture. But you know, the historians, it's just a no, no touch rule, just like it's a no touch rule to say Aborigines come from here as well. Mayan dynasties prized their female ancestors, and the Khans seemed to place great value on royal women. It's important to note that in my research that most historians are very specific that women took on these royal roles after 623 BC. However, we have already observed the meaning of patriarch and matriarch, that a matronial system was in place before the patronial. So you see the cons, they, create, they, create, they have great value over the rural women there. Uh, and I would like to say too, because the rural women, they served. They served as spiritual advisors. They were very in touch with their ceremonies and the old ways and how to communicate with spirits. So that was well respected as well. But like I said, con can be represented by a man or woman, all right? And then we have the Omic saying that they respected the Amira, the Amira people, you know, uh, the Amira wise women. But let me go on. I don't want to jump ahead. The Spanish and Portuguese Inquisitions persecuted priestess and the Coranderas from Peru to Colombia to Brazil to Mexico, targeting Aborigines, the First Nations people. In the 1600s, the Peruvian Inquisition targeted the Cuchuchas and the Illamaras, wise women, who kept the Indian religion alive and often acted to empower their communities to protect them from colonial masters and officials. You know, just how many Inquisitions was it? You know what I'm saying? Just how many Inquisitions it was. Because when I saw that movie, Borgia, that's a good show to watch, too, if you want to know more about... Um, how the Catholics went to these different countries and started invading and sending missionaries and using their political trickery and stuff. Go watch this show, Bar Borgia. It's an old show that came out in 2011, but it gives you an inside scoop on what was really going on in the Catholic Church and how they just, you know, they just destroyed indigenous cultures and manipulated them and they sent all types of people out to you know manipulate them and stuff and make them think one way and really they were trying to do something else with their land you know so i'm going to show a little bit uh, a, a clip about queen Mu because queen Mu she was she came from the americas and she went over to kemet and it says in this clip that she was fleeing so i thought this clip would be interesting to share and then i'm gonna come back and we're gonna talk a little bit about the clip and I think I'm going to close out, all right? Continuing the book Queen Mu in the Egyptian Things by Augustus uh, Plongeon. It says here in the preface still we're at, fleeing from the wrath of her brother Ak, Queen Mu directed her course toward the rising sun in the hope of finding shelter in some of the remnants of the land of Mu, as the Azores, for instance. So remember, if you're in America and you're going towards the rising sun, that means you're going to the east, right? Where the sun rises, right? East, so you're going towards Africa, or like what they said here, the Azores, right? Canary Islands, Cape Verde, West Africa, right? Failing to fall with such place of refuge as she was seeking, she continued her journey eastward and at last reached the Maya colonies that for many years had been established on the banks of the Nile. These were Maya colonies, or as they have called them, Atlantis colonies. But Atlantis was here. It's all the same kingdom. All right. So remember that she says that she reached the Maya colonies that were in the Nile. The settlers received her with open arms, called her the little sister, Ixing, or Ixing, Isis, 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 and proclaimed her their queen. 
before leaving her mother country in the West, she had caused to be erected not only a memorial hall to the memory of her brother, husband, but also a superb mausoleum in which were placed his remains and his statue representing him. On the top of the monument was his totem, a dying leopard with a human head. So wait a minute, if we're talking about America, right? You saw my Black Panther video, right? We don't have leopards in America, we got jaguars. So it's not a dying leopard, it's a dying jaguar with a human head, jaguar warrior, right? A veritable finx. So that's what the finx was? You hear what they're telling you, right? Because we know the finx head is not the real one, the, the one we see today, right? So what really it was? She's saying it was a dying leopard, right? So what was outside that it had jaguar spots? We're talking about America, right? There's no leopards over there, it's jaguars, all right? So she says she made a mausoleum before she left in that country, in America. Now, once established in the land of her adoption, right? Did she order the erection of another of his totems? Again, a leopard with a human head? to preserve the memory among her followers. We're talking about jaguar, no leopards. The name inscribed on the base of the Egyptian Sphinx seems to suggest this conjecture. All right, you hear that? Through the ages, this Egyptian Sphinx has been the enigma of history. Has its solution at last been given by the ancient Maya archives? He's telling you that this is the story he found in these archives, in these codices on the walls, that she fled to, towards that Nile, to the colony on the other side, towards the east, and that she built the Sphinx in commemorance to her brother, a jaguar warrior, or a leopard, a so-called leopard with a human head, a jaguar warrior. Has its solution of the Sphinx at last been given by the ancient Maya archives? All right, think about that. Are we going to reveal this? So that was the story of Queen Mu. I thought that she had a very interesting story. It's very interesting. Uh, but it raised some questions in me. I wanted to know why she was fleeing. And I wanted to know more about her story. And the thing about ISIS interested me as well. You know, this story of the Queens is very interesting. And when I found out some more information about it, it answered so many questions when I found just these this little paragraph about what really happened. So I'm gonna share that with you right now. Uh, and then finding out more about the author, the, ar the archeologist, La Plangeon, his story is very interesting too because his peers they kind of went against him in all this findings but it was in the murals it was in the codex this story was there so i thought it was very interesting so i'm just going to jump in here and i'm going to show you i'm going to talk about some of my notes here i have and what i found out so let's see queen mu was the eldest daughter of king kanchi and Queen Zog. She was desired by her brothers, Prince Ko and Prince A. She chose Prince Ko as her mate, and Prince A killed him in a jealous rage. After Prince Ko's death, Queen Mu fled to seek refuge in the land of Mu, and when she reached the location where it once was, she found the civilization had disappeared. So they could be talking about Atlantis here, or you know, or Lemuria, I don't, I don't know. But they also call America Atlantis as well. So I need to do some more research into that. That's very interesting. And it disappeared. So she made her way to Egypt. She made her way to Egypt. All right. And when I uh, said Queen's moon name was drawn from the Mayan word Macau based on the bird imagery in Mayan representation of her figure. You see that in, in our set with the wings, again, the feathers. See, I told you about these feathers and the bird, the bird imagery. Le Plegeon 
took, his, took this as a further evidence that Mu and Isis were the same figure, as Isis is often represented as the winged figure. See, I'm telling you, it's connections here. This is the matrineal story. This is why we can see all these connections with the dragon and all this. You know, these ancestors' mothers went all over the world. They were hunter-gatherers, and they had this connection with Earth. All right, and they were teaching people how to plant. They were giving people grains. It says Chamu means jaguar paw. See that story of Wakanda is, it is native to Tamari of ancient America. That's native to here. And Pliangian believed the great cat was Prince Cole's symbol. Pliangian claimed that Egypt Sphinx with this cat body and human head was built by Queen Mu to honor the dead and husband. I'm telling you, these queens were our first mathematicians. They were our first architects. You know, they were our first mothers, our first teachers. You know, they were our first everything. And to forget and even not talk about their history, about their legacy, what they gave to us, Oh my gosh, it's, it's more than an insult to even not recognize them being here. Their story before we gave and shared the throne with our counterparts, male counterparts. We shared that, we shared that power, we share power. And then power was totally taken away from us taken away from our mothers. It was equal. We chose to have equal power, all right? We chose to have equal power, you know? I'm not gonna be able to get into this uh, other part of this video right now. I wanna talk about the matriarch uh, military, the army of those matronial women, and I'll probably bring that in another video. But I thank you so much for being here with me today. Leave your comments, observations, any of your findings, you know, your philosophies right here on, the, on this video. I want to hear what you got to say. I want to hear your thoughts on this. This is some very interesting information. You know, I've learned some things going down this road, working with the ancestors and just following the story, following the information without biasness. You know, seeing what's out there, you know, do your own research. This is where the ancestors are leading me. This is the path that I'm on. You know, I'm just sharing it with you. So I uh, hopefully you'll see me in the next video, uh, in the next part, because it's going to be a part three to this. I didn't know it was going to be a part three, but it's going to be a part three to this. And I hope to see you there. Light and love. May the ancestors be with you.